Good morning, everybody. Ooh, that sounds loud. I am Jay Stephen Simpson. I'm pastor here at Christ Church. I want to say welcome to everyone that's here and welcome to everyone that's worshiping with us online. We're so glad to have you. I have just a couple of announcements that I want to mention now. Uh, the first one is that uh, the United Methodist Men will be meeting on the 28th. That's a Thursday evening. Uh, the 7th, we will have our finance committee meeting and administrative uh, council meeting. Of course, we have um, chili supper coming up in the third week of uh, February. Looking forward to that. So if you um, would put those things on your calendars, um, that would be wonderful. Other than that, I don't have any other announcements. Do you? In that case, let's begin our worship. I'd like to invite our children to come forward. Well, kids, I have a question for you, and I have a Bible story that I want to share with you. So I'm going to ask you the question first, and I want you to, don't just blurt out the answer. I want you to think about it, okay? Does God ever change his mind? Think about it. Just think about it. Don't answer just yet. Does God change his mind? Hmm. I'm going to read you, or I'm going to tell you a story, and I bet it's a story that you already know. Who knows about the story of Jonah? Who knows? 
So if you remember the story of Jonah, God said that he was sending Jonah to the city of Nineveh because Nineveh was an evil place. And God said that he was going to destroy Nineveh. And so he sent Jonah to tell them to repent. And you know the story, Jonah didn't want to go and he went, he was thrown off the boat and was swallowed up by the fish and was in the fish for three days. Well, eventually Jonah decides, well, I better go and tell them. And so that's where our story picks up. And I'm just going to read a few verses. This is from Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Then I'm going to skip over to, to verse 10. This is our answer. Are you ready for it? When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now, did I give away the answer? Does God change his mind? He does, but why do you think that he does it? Do you think that just one day he decides, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this, and then the next day decides, no, 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 I'm going to do that? That's not the way that it works, is it? What is it that changes God's mind? It was right there in the scriptures. It said, whoops, wrong one. It said that right there in verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. So it was when the people believed God and turned away from their sin, that's when God changed his mind. When else can you think of that God would change his mind? I'll tell you, when he changes his mind is when we pray. That's the whole reason that we pray is because things are going a certain way and we need God's help. And so we pray to God, God, please help us do this or please change that. And that's when God changes his mind, when he sees us in action. And when he sees us changing our ways, that's when God changes his mind. So keep that in mind. We need to always turn away from our sin, but we also need to pray to God so that he will change his mind. Let's pray together. Dear God, I thank you that you hear our prayers and that you are faithful and just and that you will change your mind when we pray. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jay Stephen. And good morning. As we continue with our worship, we will join in and share our joys and concerns, starting with Linda Perkins, Johnny Reed, Robert Ryan, Paul Walker, Steve Grissom, Paula Starling, Danny Pugh, Pam Lindsay, Curtis Adkins, Ron Ferguson, Delma Green, Benita George, Sandra and Gary Albright, Jennifer Clem, Madeline Lawrence, Jerry Hudson, Eddie and Chestine Sheffield, Becky and Dave Daly, Joe Hessel, Sylvia Kakis uh, family, Melissa Smith, Cutter Harmon, Joe and Linda Lorenz, John Trusley, Tommy Garner, Kristen Taylor, Kelly and Hannah Standifer, Randall Morris, Ray Harris, Lloyd and Debbie Perry, Ann Honeycutt, Travis and Ann Snipper, Carol Roberts, Martha Trusley, Danny Gonzalez, Tessa Stevenson, Wanda Bearden, 
Susan Long, a lady named Sharon, Brian Henry, Alan Clements, Michaela Westbrook, Abby uh, Haggard, Brian Perry, Rucker Thomas, Ken and Dorlene Simpson, Ralph Burns, Bobby Love, Celia Velasquez, Judy Turner, Bobby Hudgens, Marty and Pam Dugan, Susan Glendening, Ed Bird, Dennis Page, Brent Wakefield, Jesse Fifield, Beckett Purifoy, Lauren Simmons, Janice Balladarsh, uh, Dot Lowe, Leanne Brazel, uh, family of Christy Powell, the family of Jack Reeves, the family of Pam Craker, our country, and also want to lift up Paul Stubbs this morning. Paul's going to be going for some tests here this next week, so we would just want to pray that as he uh, gets the results of these tests that they come back negative and there's nothing for him to worry about. So please remember that this week. Do we have others this morning? Whoops, I got another list. Hang on just a second. Uh, Monty Sullivan and Unspoken and the Purifoy family. Who? Frank Klingen? Okay. Remember Frank Klingen? Vic? Uh, no, man. Curtis Maxey? Family of Karen Campbell. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ken. Anyone else? God, as we come to you this morning, it is evident that we need you in such a mighty way. With all the names that were mentioned this morning, all the needs that are there, but what we can rest in is knowing, God, that you already know each and every one of these needs down to the very smallest detail. So God, there is nothing, nothing too big for you, and there's nothing too small that you don't want us to talk to you about and to ask you to help us. But God, we thank you not just for listening to us when we pray and hear what's on our heart, but God, we thank you so much for taking care of us each and every day. And we see it, we know it, and we believe it. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died for each and every one of us, who loves each and every one of us, and came to save each and every one of us. So God, as we've gathered here this morning, we're coming here in agreement that we know that you are alive, we know that you can heal us, we know that you love us. So we come today, God, just lifting you up, ready to receive the words that you have prepared through J. Stephen. And as we sing the songs that to praise you and to give you honor and glory. And when we do all these things today, and we walk out of this building, that we'll be that light and that example that you call on each and every one of us to be, that this world needs so badly. And God, with these that we mentioned this morning, and with the unspokens that we have, a lot of times we need to just let go and let you do what you do because you've already told us in so many times, in so many ways, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And there's so many that need that right now, and you know it. And we just trust in you and thanking you again for all that you do for us. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. 
Amen. If you will, join with me now this morning as we have our responsive reading, which comes from Psalms chapter 62, verses 5 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from Him. On God rest my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us to place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be home soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Shout the victory. If you would bow with me. Oh God, we are so grateful for all of the many blessings that you give to us in our lives, for our family, for our friends, for our wealth. We ask that you would take this, that we return to you now and use it for your kingdom. May it bless those who benefit from it. And may those who give it be equally blessed. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Now let us declare our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. How is everyone today? We've got Harris. One person is good. I'm so glad for you. Philip, how's everybody else? <laughs> All right, great. I see some faces I haven't seen in a while. I'm so happy.
never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, you're good.
Lord, we sang King of My Heart earlier that you remind us, Lord, to let you be our king, to let you take over, to let you live and for Jesus to just have authority in everything that we do, God, that no matter what's going on, that we know, we know who's in charge, Lord. I just pray that if we have any broken pieces, Lord, that anyone here will allow you to pick them up, Lord, and for you to put them back together. And I just thank you for the privilege that we have for you to be our healer and our way maker in everything that we need. In Jesus' precious name. Scripture reading today is from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Mark 1, 14 to 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee... He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, we adore you. And as we gather, we lay our lives down before you like the broken vessel that we were singing of. We seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We seek to be part of your kingdom. Oh Lord, If there are those here today who have doubts and fears, I ask that you would grant them your peace. This congregation of people, this gathering of the faithful, seek to live their lives in such a way that your kingdom might grow and your word be proclaimed here in Texarkana. On behalf of this congregation, I ask that you might forgive us in the many ways that we sin and help us to know that our only hope is in your Son, Jesus. We pray all of these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So as... uh, As I was reading that scripture and I I heard those words that Jesus said, repent and believe in the good news, believe the gospel. It reminded me that very shortly we are going to be having Ash Wednesday service. And I don't know how you've celebrated Ash Wednesday in the past, but this year on February the 17th, that's of course a Wednesday, (laughs) we are going to be having a service at 7.30, and it's not just a, a service that you can come to and just enjoy yourself and have a good time. It is a service where we are going to be making solemn vows, commitments to Jesus Christ for the upcoming Lenten season. See, we are going to be preparing ourselves this year to receive Jesus at, at, at Easter like we've never seen him before. 
this Ash Wednesday, we will be looking inward at our examining our own lives at the sin that we have, and then we are going to lay it down before Jesus. And we are going to commit ourselves over the upcoming six weeks after that to live our lives in a different way, to live our lives for Jesus. And so I would invite you to go ahead and put it on your calendar, whatever you might have planned. Cancel those plans. It's going to be that important to our church. It's going to be that important to you that you be here or you be on, online and watching. We will have it online. That's Wednesday, the February the 17th, 7.30. So I ask you, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you been called out just like Simon and Andrew and, or James and John were in the scriptures that we just read? Those seem like simple questions, don't they? Because I know that if you are here today, if you're tuned in today, I know that you're already called to be a disciple. And so I want us to talk about what it means. I want to talk today about a topic that I'm going to call secular Christianity. As I talk through this topic, I want to ask you to keep that question in mind. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And have you been called like Simon and Andrew and James and John? You know, when I use the term secular Christianity, what do you think that I mean? Well, two words. The second is Christianity. We, we know what Christianity is, right? What do you think of when I say Christianity? When I say secular, what do you think that I mean? Well, I'm going to read for you the five tenets of what defines secular Christianity in today's world. Now, you might say this is the Apostles' Creed of, of the modern world even. Listen to them and see if it sounds more like the Christianity that you find in the world than you find here at Christ Church. Number one, a God exists and ordered the world and watches over human life. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, fair to each other, and as taught in the Bible and other world religions. Three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. Number four, God doesn't need to participate particularly in someone's life except when, you know, when God needs to resolve a problem for us. And number five, good people go to heaven when they die. Now, does that sound good to you? <laughs> I'm wondering if that sounds like Christianity as you encounter in the world today, though. It most certainly sounds like what I encounter in the world. You know, it's interesting. When, when I hear people in the world use foul language in front of me, or maybe they tell an off-color joke, uh, the moment that they discover that I'm a pastor... They tend to come and apologize, as though I'm somehow the foul language police. And it happens to me over and over and over. They somehow seem to feel this obligation to be nice in front of me. Am I right, Wendy? Not that you've used foul language, no. That's not what I mean. It happens over and over, though. You know, the thing is, I don't really care. I mean, I'm not bothered... It, that you use foul language. I'm not bothered that you decide to tell those kinds of jokes. So what changes when you find out that I'm a pastor? Is your standing with the pastor somehow a substitute for your standing with God? Maybe that's the sixth tenet. You know, people think they've got to be nice. Well, you know what? I would rather that you just be nice because you're nice, not because you're trying not to offend me. You know what the second thing that people say after that? That is, if they consider themselves to be religious at all, they always tell me, well, you know, this is where I used to go to church. And nine times out of ten, they say it this way. Oh, well, you know, I used to go to church where my mother 
goes to church. You know, looking back at that list, there's not much of a problem with it, is there? I mean, it fits in nicely with our feel-good, individualistic culture, doesn't it? I mean, Christian people are nice people, aren't we? Is there a problem with this way of seeing and living out Christianity? Well, of course there is, or otherwise I wouldn't be preaching about it today. I want to talk about at least three problems that I see with it. First, this secular Christianity reduces Christian ethics to merely being nice. You know, did you know that Jesus never told us to be nice? I I read an article one time, and there's a little devotional that I like to give sometimes about that article, and the title of the article was, Jesus wasn't a nice guy, and you shouldn't be either. See, Jesus wasn't a nice guy. Now, Jesus was kind, compassionate, but he wasn't what we would call nice. See, what the gospel talks about is kindness and compassion, justice, forgiveness, loving your enemies. See, these things are a lot harder than just being nice. Most people equate being nice with friendliness and not stepping on someone's toes. But you know, this tends to just gloss over the uniqueness of the other person. It prevents us from being able to love them as they truly are. It puts up a front that prevents me from getting to know them, and it it also prevents them from getting to know me. Being Christ-like means meeting people where they are, and then extending God's love to them without condition. See, being nice is not the same thing as that. Being Christ-like means extending God's love to others without condition. Now, those people that apologize to me about their language or or whatever, they, they don't realize that I really don't care about their behavior. I just want to be able to demonstrate God's unconditional love to them in spite of their behavior, in spite of who they might be. Now, second, this secular Christianity is all about me and my comfort, and my happiness. See, God loves us and wants us to be happy. Now, there's some humor coming. So I once saw this t-shirt, and it said, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. And it was a quote, it was attributed to Benjamin Franklin. Now, it's been shown over and over again, though, that he never said that. Nope, he was talking about wine. It's true. Go look it up. (laughs) See, God does indeed want us to be happy. He does love us. But personal self-fulfillment is not the source of genuine happiness. True joy comes from us sharing our humanity with others. Our delights, our suffering. True Christianity is not about me at all. Now, certainly the gospel message is for me, but it's not a selfish gospel. Christianity is about participating in the kingdom of God in the here and now. Now, it's a religion that's more directed toward others than it is about me. We're called to share our lives with our neighbors. And sharing our lives means that when our neighbor suffers... We are called to step in and help carry one another's burdens. Now, don't get me wrong. Secular Christianity is concerned with the community, with the physical world. But you know what? There's a big difference in carrying someone's burdens and being concerned about the environment, for example. See, Christ cared more about you than he did about his own life. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus cared more about you than he did about his own life. In Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 31, Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he answers this way. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. We're to love God. We're to love our neighbors. You know, this current obsession with self is not the mark of true Christianity. God does not exist to meet my needs, to help me be a nice person who feels good about myself. And third, secular Christianity, as I described, can't withstand shipwreck. Now, shipwreck is a a term that was coined by a theologian named Richard Niebuhr, and he defines it this way. Shipwreck is the shattering of self that happens when life hits the rocks. Well, guess what? We experience shipwreck at some point in our lives. We lose a parent or a spouse or a child. We lose a job or, or we're the victim of some crime or or we get that diagnosis that we never wanted to hear. That's shipwreck. If religion exists for the purpose of feeling good and doing nice things, when we experience shipwreck in our lives, that religion is absolutely useless. Religion doesn't help an abuse victim to feel good about it. It doesn't help her to be nice to her abuser, and she shouldn't. In times of shipwreck, feeling good about ourselves, being nice, it's really unthinkable. See, the bigger problem is that if that's all that religion is for, then shipwreck will convince us that God's either made up or or absolutely useless, like I said before. It's at those moments that we don't need those things. We need someone that's going to carry our burdens. We need someone that's been there and experienced it. See, Christians aren't called to avoid suffering. We're called to move towards it. Do you hear that? We're not called to avoid suffering. We are called to move towards suffering. When someone around you is experiencing shipwreck, We should move towards them. We should stand alongside them and lift them up and carry their burdens for them. That's what Christians do. That's what each one of you does. Through Jesus, we hear about his dying and his being raised to life because of his love for us. And because of this love for us, we get to participate in this process of transformation that's called new birth. See, through Jesus' life and death and resurrection, Christ doesn't merely glue our shattered lives back together. He actually makes us into new persons. The Gospels argue that our lives and and our futures are are bound up together with God. But at the same time, we're called to be disciples and to participate in God's movement through history. Now, you know what? God could choose to do this work alone, but he chooses to include us. In fact, God calls each one of us to participate in moving toward the future. See, this is God's gift to us, offered so that we can participate in in the kingdom of God and and in God's redemptive purposes. Now, I've presented some problems with secular Christianity. I've talked about how different it is than true Christianity. I want to go back now and ask you that question that I asked you to hold on to. Are you called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, what do you think it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in this world of secular Christianity? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that you are called to be different. It means that you are called to be Jesus. 
As difficult as that may seem, that's what we're called to do, and that's who we are called to be to this world. And so, it's going to take some serious examination on our part. Some serious examination of our lives and, and a hearing, again, of the calling that's on our life. So, I ask you, do you want in on this gift that God offers to us? Do you want to participate in the kingdom of God? Do you want to be a part of that? If so, you're in the right place. All you've got to do is turn it over to Jesus. Ask him to come into your life to replace your will with his will. And then to embrace true Christianity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This morning as we prepare to sing our closing hymn, I ask that you would examine your heart. Look to God. Listen to Him as we sing, because He lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Hear this benediction. Go from this place knowing how much Jesus loves you and cares for you and desires to be a part of your life. Take the gospel message to a hurting world. Go now in peace. Amen.